Good evening. I'm Madeline Peel, and I'm the moderator of Community Board 8 Speaks. And this evening, I'm with Dave Liston, who's the chair of our board at Community Board 8, which is 59th to 96th Street from 5th Avenue um, all the way to the East River and all of Roosevelt Island. And this evening, we have a very important issue. It's on domestic violence. And the forum's going to include elected officials from the city council. Uh, we're going to have people from the assembly, uh, the Manhattan Borough President's Office, the DA's Office, and also Harlem Legal Services, and imp very importantly, the Police Department. So Dave, why is this such an important issue for the people in all communities, but a, no, really our community at Community Board 8? I think, I think Madeline, thanks for asking, because it's such a good question. I think one of the reasons why it's significant that we're doing this here in Community Board 8 is because domestic violence, aside from being a truly important issue, perhaps one of the most important issues you can imagine, is an issue in our community board as much as any other community board. Uh, and it's something that people don't talk about at all or often enough. Um, and tonight, what we hope to do is bring around the table uh, all the various agencies who deal with this important issue uh, and, and bring them to the community. Because yeah. ultimately, this is a community problem that requires community solutions. And that's what community boards specialize in. Yeah, and one of the things that this show does for people is provides an outreach into people's homes so that it might not be something you talk about with your neighbor, but it is something that you can watch on TV and start thinking about and then talking to your friends about. You're right, Madeline. That's one of the reasons I'm so glad we're covering this for, for uh, the show because it's so important for these folks here tonight to hear this but but for but, all of you but by you covering it tonight hopefully many more many more people will get the message which is that domestic violence is important domestic violence uh, is unacceptable uh, and and it's a problem that can be solved I'd like to thank all of you uh, on behalf of myself and the committee for coming out on such a cold night uh, this is a very important topic uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers for you tonight, uh, starting with our councilman, Dan Gorodnik. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Gorodnik, and I am uh, the local council member for this area, um, for District 4, uh, which um, goes from 14th Street up to 97th Street. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking uh, Community Board 8 and the Public Safety Committee and everyone here for recognizing uh, the importance of addressing this issue in a public forum. Um, and I am very honored and uh, hopeful um, about this forum and I'm glad to be able to open the meeting which will address issues of domestic violence, uh, intimate relationship violence, dating violence and sexual assault, and child abuse. Uh, according to the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, in 2005, police responded to 226,272 domestic violence incidents, which translates to approximately 620 incidents per day. And in the same year, there were 51,704 situations of child abuse which were reported to ACS. Um, thank you to Community Board 8 uh, and the committee for inviting me to uh, present uh, some uh, information this evening. Also, uh, thank you for including me with this very distinguished panel of experts in this field. Um, the domestic violence is an issue that transcends age, ethnicity, background, and socioeconomic level. It affects all aspects of victims' lives and their families. Uh, there are many different forms of domestic violence, including physical, psychological, and sexual abuse. And uh, Dan mentioned one statistic, but another statistic which is really frightening is that according to the New York State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence, battering is the major cause of injury to women aged 14 to 45, causing more injuries than auto accidents, muggings, and rapes combined. And up to 70%, it's estimated up to 70% of men who abuse their partner also abuse their children. Thank you, Jonathan. My name is Will Sanchez. I'm one of the co-chairs. And it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists tonight. First up is uh, Deputy Borough President Rose Pierre Louis. Really, when we're talking about domestic violence, it's important to understand that it's really at the core of the definition is that it's really the abuse of power and control in an intimate relationship. And that really, when you're looking at it and trying to define it, we understand that domestic violence really is about a pattern of sometimes assaultive but coercive behavior that is intended to intimidate, 
to isolate the victims uh, and certainly to control uh, their actions. And sometimes it can be physical force, but as someone just mentioned previously, it can also include acts of intimidation, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, which oftentimes I've heard from clients, can be more damaging than the physical violence itself. Someone mentioned verbal abuse as a dynamic of domestic violence. Any other thoughts of dynamics of domestic violence, what that might be? Everybody knows the punch in the face, right? The black eye seems to be like the poster of what people think when they think about domestic violence. Yes, ma'am. Um, financial abuse. Absolutely. Any, well, I'll just say okay, financial abuse, we have verbal, financial, we know the physical. Any other thoughts? Sexual. Sexual, absolutely. Can a, uh, can a husband rape their wife? Yes, we were actually the last state to enact a statute uh, that provided for that. Um, certainly, um, a batterer could use uh, a victim as a sexual object, certainly withholding of sex. We have seen in situations where the batterer might be HIV positive, for example, that forcing your intimate partner to have unprotected sex, knowing that there's a possibility for a transmission. We know there's emotional abuse, where a lot of it is part of the power and control. You attack the victim's self-esteem. You're fat, you're ugly, nobody wants you. Uh, I'm the only one who can love you and take care of you. Those kinds of things. Name calling, calling you, uh, you know, derogatory names or names that are uh, designed to reduce your self-esteem. Certainly withholding of affection, uh, some might characterize as emotional abuse. Certainly extreme jealousy and accusations. I know that a lot of my clients talk about one of the, the abusive qualities that they saw in their batterer was that this excessive jealousy, the mailman comes over and you say thank you, and then there are allegations that you're having some kind of uh, physical relationship. Certainly economic abuse is something that a lot of times people don't pick up on. Once again, people think of domestic violence solely as the punch in the face, but it really is a variety of actions that are designed to affect the self-esteem, to exhibit power and control, to isolate victims from their social support. Oftentimes, you know, a batterer may pull you away from your family so that you don't have the social supports that are necessary. But it's often important to understand that economic abuse, uh, taking over one's paycheck, harassing a partner at work, we see that a lot where uh, the batterer may not physically abuse you, but the batterer is calling you 30 and 40 times at, at your job. Um, and it's sort of an aggravated harassment type of situation where you may end up losing your job or there might be some other uh, problems and certainly create an environment of fear for you. One of the questions that I think all of us on this panel get asked all the time, and I used to get asked this when I used to try domestic violence cases, is why doesn't she leave? And I think oftentimes it's really frustrating because if you follow domestic violence cases, you'll see that what's, what are some of the obstacles uh, related to why victims don't leave? Yes? Financial. That's right. Financial. Any other thoughts? It's intimidated psychologically, financially, in every way. That's right. Any other thoughts? It increases their danger. That's right. What, do you want to follow on that in terms um, of increasing danger? Well, I mean, most of the time when you know, a victim would report a domestic violence incident, you know, it would just put her at greater risk for getting, you know, assaulted again. Um, and could, and a lot of time leads to murder. And I think what everyone just said is so um, right on point because I think it's important to understand that if you have children, you can't up and leave. In the state of New York, let's say you wanted to start a new life, like, you know, you see these movies, they get in the car and they run off. Batterers are very sophisticated when it comes to the court system, and I think my colleagues would agree with that. In the state of New York, you can't just up and leave with your children. You have to seek the court's permission. So if you have children, you might find yourself, if you flee with the children, that the batterer may file what's called the writ of habeas corpus to bring you back to the state and have to answer to a judge why you left with the children. So it's important that there could be some obstacles. And certainly, 
in, term, in terms of increasing your risk of homicide if you follow domestic violence cases, and I hope moving forward when you read these cases you will see that oftentimes when the victim gets killed is when? After she has left the relationship. Not while she's in the relationship, but when the chain of power and control has been open, uh, broken, it increases the uh, opportunity for uh, and homicide to take place. I just want to once again really, really thank the Public Safety Committee and Community Board 8 and for all of you to take the time to be here. And I hope that this dialogue will be ongoing on domestic violence. Thank you very much. I'm supposed to talk to you a little bit about family court and one of the ways that women get safe from domestic violence or, or get to a place of safety from domestic violence is often through the courts. And a couple of things that you have to know about family court is um, first that family court is a civil court. Uh, so it's kind of like one person suing another person for whatever relief it is that they want. In family court, in this case, in terms of orders of protection, you would go to family court to get an order of protection and you're suing the person who has committed what's called a family offense against you and you're asking the court to protect you in the form of this order of the court that tells this person how to behave, basically. Um, so it starts off with the incident of abuse and that incident could be any of the incidents that we talked about. Could be verbal abuse, could be some form of psychological or emotional abuse, could be some form of verbal abuse, um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, but the, the family court definition of a family offense is basically um, a series of crimes. And the family court uses um, the criminal definitions of assault, stalking, harassing, menacing. So you would have to go to family court and you do what's called file a family offense petition. The family offense petition is a sworn petition as in if you're familiar with civil cases what would be a complaint um, or in, in a criminal case which they'll talk about which is probably more like the, the criminal complaint or the, the, um, the, the piece of paper that's going to set out everything that happened. So the family offense petition is going to allege in a sworn document whatever actions uh, the, the batterer has committed against the victim. Wait, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Before you can get to family court, you have to qualify under the family court definition as a family. And I will point out that the family court definition is much more restrictive than, than NYPD's definition and then, the, and then the criminal court definition is. So to get into family court, you have to be either related, you have to be related by blood, um, which means brother, sister, father, daughter, mother, uncle, any blood relationship, any familial relationship um, can get you into family court. Or you could be related by marriage, meaning you are or were married, even if you're not currently married. Um, if you have been married and maybe you're already divorced, whatever the case may be, you can get into family court if you had marriage in your history. Um, you can also get into family court if you have a child in common. If you have a child in common, um, it doesn't matter whether or not you lived with the child's other parent or not, you can still get into family court based on having that child in common, even if you're not litigating issues of custody or visitation or child support. So you're gonna go to family court, you're gonna file a petition, and you will get that day, you're gonna see the judge immediately. Well, not immediately. I mean, family court immediately is like maybe five, six hours later. But after you file your petition, soon after you file your petition, meaning that same day, you will see a judge. The judge is gonna make some inquiries as to what happened in the petition, what's going on, are there children, are children affected, who lives where, where is everybody, you know, the judge wants to make sure sort of what's going on and the judge also wants to make sure that there is actually a family offense alleged. So the judge has to basically take whatever's in the petition, verify to the best of their ability that that is, there is some basis for what's in the petition and they will on that date issue a temporary order of protection. An order of protection in family court can be issued for two or five years. So the statutory minimum is two years. So if a victim alleges a family offense and the judge finds that, sorry, a family offense was committed, the minimum is two years. You can get an order of protection in family court for up to five years 
if a judge finds what's called aggravating circumstances. And aggravating circumstances can be anything from repeated police reports, repeated violations of an order of protection, uh, if children were present, if children were injured, if the injuries are so severe that the judge feels that they're, they're sort of a standout case or sort of worse than the average case, I hate to use that phrase, but um, if, if it's a case that is somewhat shocking to a judge, which I'll be honest, is a little hard, <laughs> but if it is a case that sort of raises eyebrows, you probably will get um, a five-year order of protection for aggravating circumstances. My job in family court is a little bit easier than my <laughs> counterpart, the ADA's office, because the standard of proof in family court is lower. So I don't have to you know, prove my case beyond a reasonable doubt as you do in, fam in criminal court. In family court, you just have to show that it's more likely than not. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank, I'll, I'll keep my comments brief regarding the thanks. I'll just echo what the other panelists said. Thank you, Community Board 8, for having the Public Safety Committee and having me be part of this panel. I've been in the police department now almost 23 years, and as I listen to the description of family court or the dynamics, I cannot believe that we are still dealing with the issue of domestic violence. The most important thing from a police perspective is a 911 call, particularly since 911, I'm, I'm surrounded by lawyers on the panel, it's always important to look at any case or police response from the courtroom's perspective. A 911 call is the first piece of evidence if a victim is able to make that call. It allows the police to have an exact time and date of the event, and more importantly, should a victim later in court hear the level of their duress at that time, it makes them understand that what happened to them was in fact a crime. <coughs> One of the most difficult aspects of domestic violence or of sexual assault is the fact that people are known to each other. There is a loyalty. We do not see this same level of connection when a person is a victim of a robbery. The other day, I, I know it was stated that judges don't get shocked too often, cops don't get shocked too often, but I must say the other day when I was reading in the paper of a man being accused in New Jersey of sexually assaulting his estranged wife in the basement of their home, and he had already allegedly uh, set fire to the house, I looked at that and I said to myself, well, there's a new twist. You now have to be cognizant of arson investigation, sexual assault, and issues of domestic violence. And the only thing that was missing from there was acts of violence against the family pet because the first, and I say this as an educational standpoint, please understand that cruelty against an animal is now in New York State a felony. It's been a felony now for about two years. The reason why this is important for us to know is because violence against an animal in a household may precede the violence against the children or against an adult partner. So in the effort to keep our community safe, we need to identify the behaviors and we need to recognize that behavior has no race, no creed, no color or gender. Violence should be reported to the police. Currently, right now, the New York City Police Department has a domestic violence unit that was formed in 1995. Currently is headed by a deputy chief, which is a very, very high-ranking uniform position. Deputy Chief Kathy Ryan oversees that unit. She has domestic violence prevention officers in every single police precinct and domestic violence investigators in the detective units in the precincts. This is a multidisciplinary problem, but the starting point is a call to the police. The police, when they respond, uniform officers respond. The NYPD has suffered losses of officers, fatal losses of officers, who were killed in responding to a domestic violence call. These are people who were trained. These are people who were wearing resist, bullet-resistant vests. And again, 
if a person in their family, and again to review that definition because it's critically important, Family Court Act of New York defines family as people who are legally married, people who were formerly legally married, people related by marriage, people related by blood, or people who have a child in common. The NYPD, in the efforts to take a complaint report and a domestic incident report, administratively expands that definition. Uh, it's called the expanded definition of family to include people who live together in a family type relationship or people who formally live together in a family type relationship. The bottom line is if there's violence, if you hear violence and screaming and yelling, that domestic violence is a priority call simply because we have no way of knowing which domestic dispute, which argument is going to escalate to the point where it's lethal to the victim, the children, companion animals there. So for a victim who's facing violence at the hands of her partner, or since this is not just a heterosexual problem, if a woman is facing violence at the hands of her lesbian partner, again, it's an issue of who do you tell? Segments of the community have issues with the NYPD, but regardless of a person's feelings, it's absolutely critical that people understand a 911 call is the quickest way to get medical attention, a police response, and to become safe. When you ask a person who uses violence what do they want, as was stated previously, it's about power and control. They want to control the behavior. They want their partner to stop them from doing something. The second aspect that these men would never take into consideration was that under New York State law, each one of us has the right to defend ourselves, Article 35, justification of New York State law. And it never occurred to them that their, their victim partner could feel so endangered that if this argument is taking place in the kitchen and he's choking her by the throat and she can reach back and get a knife because he's going to kill her so she feels, he never thought that there could be a danger to himself. I just want to mention some exciting projects that we're uh, doing at the DA's office. Um, one of them is together with the borough president. Uh, what Rose mentioned about calling victims who have filed domestic incident reports and offering them services before the next incident, before an arrest. Uh, we are actually intimately connected with that in the 33rd and 34th precincts. We're the ones reaching out uh, in, in those areas. We're very excited about that and to be working with you. Um, another very exciting thing is the integrated uh, domestic violence part, which means courtroom. Uh, that's a special court where families go who have a case in family court and in criminal court. In the past, there were a lot of problems with conflicting orders of protection, which have been mentioned. And also, victims of domestic violence uh, frankly got the shaft in a lot of custody or visitation or child support cases because the judges just weren't aware that there were domestic violence issues going on. Now a clerk looks whether there's a case in both courts, and if there is, the, the cases are joined uh, on a principle of one family, one judge, so that the judge can see everything that's going on. Uh, the victims are offered services right there in the courtroom. There uh, hopefully will also be a Safe Horizons room and counselors, we hope. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we're just hoping for a lot more, more clarity and uh, work together. So that's pretty much it. I'm the last speaker, so I'll keep it short but sweet. Thank you all very much for coming to share your knowledge with us. Uh, we're going to open the floor now for questions. And Are there any programs in the schools, sort of preventive measures? And my other question um, is, are there seasons, are there particularly particular times of the year when domestic violence spikes? Let me start with the last question in terms of spikes. Um, for a long time, people said that domestic violence, you would see a spike of cases during the Super Bowl. And, and I think there's been a lot said to sort of dispel that. Yes, the DA's office is going into schools. Um, in fact, that's how I ended up here tonight, is till tonight I'd only spoken to high school students. <laughs> um, we have an interactive curriculum about teen dating violence. Um, they read a story about Jennifer and Joseph with all the signs of domestic violence. Joseph gives Jennifer a cell phone, but then he calls her day and night checking up on her whereabouts. You know, he buys her clothes, but then he tells her that she's dressing like a slut and eventually it escalates to him hitting her. And it always gets the kids talking. They have amazing questions. 
you'd also be amazed what is normal to them. You know, a kid in the back of the classroom who will raise his hand and be like, well, I watched my mom beat up my sister all the time. Is that domestic violence? Like, is it domestic violence if you got welts on you or not? Um, after reading about the Nix Murray Brown case and the recent Sean Hornbeck case, one thing that, um, that was disturbing for me was the number of opportunities where people could have intervened. I share with you your concern when you look back from a horrible event and you go back and you see how many people could have done something if they had just said something. And that's something that I'm hoping that people will either call up the state central register or call up the police if they hear the sounds of screaming and yelling because you must understand you may be saving somebody's life, including your own, because you don't know if those people have a gun next door. And not everything, you know, the walls in New York, if you can hear your neighbors, a 38 caliber bullet or a nine millimeter shot can go through your walls. This may sound drastic, but the issue is domestic violence is not a private event, it's a community event. It affects all of us. So if you hear something, not just in counterterrorism, say something. Good evening. I'm here this evening with the co-chairs of the forum, Will Sanchez and Matt Bondi. This is a very exciting program we've had this evening, and could you tell us a little bit more about how it got organized, Will? Oh, it's almost by accident. Uh, we met earlier last year, we decided on the forum, and when we started doing the spade work, we got a call from Dan Karaktik's office, who was interested in doing Our this. Our council member. Yes, for this, council yeah. member Dan Karaktik. Right. And he was interested in doing for public housing and we said hey we already started let's work together on this oh great great now Matt what about some of the the, the contacts in, in in the city government were you both able to pull together a variety of different people and and how is this going to help the public understand what's really happening well our, our panelists were great and the more people we can we can reach on this important subject the better uh, but I think will should ad address the uh, the panelists and how they came to uh, be a part of this forum here. Right, but um, during the forum we had uh, a variety of different uh, people get up and talk and um, questions from the audience about this important subject and basically what are we trying to do in public? Are, are we trying to, um, is it is it an educational job and has this just started? It, it is. Um, like you heard the panelists say, this is a problem that happens in every neighborhood throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, the more people we can reach and the more people that we can educate and the more people that we can show uh, that there are resources out there that are available to them, the better.